please rise in body or in spirit and join with me in the call to worship. In the beauty of an autumn Sunday, we gather to worship God who gifts us with all the seasons of our lives. We gather as we are, whether ours is a season of sadness or joyfulness, a season of ordinary days or exciting celebration. We gather in that embrace that will never let us go, standing by us in all times and seasons, remembering the words of the psalmist, Come, let us worship God. Please remain standing and let us sing, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, which is number 435 in the hymnal. be seated. God is not surprised by our confessions, even though sometimes we are. Let us confess, first silently, and then together as the body of believers. Let us pray. And let us pray together. O Holy One, you call your church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. But is anyone listening? You call your church to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may turn to you. But is anyone listening? When we become utterly frustrated, that no one seems to be hearing your good news, we need to be awakened and reminded that more than words, it is the attitudes we project and the actions of our day-to-day -day lives that bear witness to what we truly believe. Grant us grace to reflect upon the messages our lives are proclaiming, intentionally and unintentionally. Let us remember that those who seem not to be listening are seen. Forgive us when we forget that our faith is lived and not just a subject of conversation. Trusting in his amazing grace, we offer this prayer in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. Let us pass the peace of Christ to each other.
language shall we borrow, gracious God? Will it be language of inclusion or exclusion? Language of love or hate? Language of creation or destruction? Guide our hearts now as we seek to explore the language of your love through your word. Amen. In just a few sentences, the Apostle Paul dismantles the divisions of ethnicity, class, and gender, and brings us into oneness in Christ. Let us listen to Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. Thanks for coming up. I thought maybe I could do this without the microphone, but apparently I can't. <laughs> um, I said young adults because I wanted to make sure that the older children in our church that we recognize that you are growing up. 
and you are a young adult, specifically these three right here. And someday, Slater's going to be there. So um, today we're going to be talking about loving your neighbor and loving your enemies. Can you guys tell me what you think is an enemy? How someone would be an enemy to you? Evan? Anna? Maybe someone who you like don't agree with or sometimes can be a little bit rude. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. You agree? Yeah, someone that's maybe not nice to you and you don't agree with. So, but Jesus says, we're supposed to love our enemies. So what could we do to love our enemy, like somebody that we don't agree with? What were the things we could do, or maybe not do? What do you think? Like, be nice to them and stuff. Be nice to them? Yeah, yeah. What do you think, Evan? Like, find a way to agree with them or something. Kind of find a way to agree with them sometimes. Um, but I think what we can do is accept what they think or do, like not lash back at them or argue, but allow them to be who they are, but show them who you are. And you can show them who you are by not arguing, by not lashing back, like, oh, you're stupid, or, you know, why would you think that, or why are you being so mean, you know? But show kindness and acceptance. And I think that's the same thing that we need to do loving our neighbor, right? You all have neighbors, right? <laughs> um, and you show love. Yeah, and Slater, I got to bring him in, um, he just loves everybody here. So he's already starting out on the right path of loving your neighbor no matter what. You don't have to agree, okay? That's not what we're saying. Everyone has their own thoughts, right, about things. But we don't have to be angry back at them, you know, or make them feel unaccepted because of what they think, right? Okay, all right, you know one thing we need to do though? We need to, before we go back, stand up. We need to wave to our online. Krista would be disappointed if we didn't. We're thinking of you, Krista. <laughs> all right, thank you. You guys have a great day. It's always a great honor for me to have the opportunity to come back to Parkville again. I have many very pleasant memories of having been with you on previous occasions. And so today it's uh, a special privilege for me. I also want to bring you greetings from Dixie Selvage. You have gifted Dixie to the Grace Covenant congregation where my wife and I worship and we love her there very much. She has been a important part of our congregation. So we are grateful for Dixie, as I know you are as well. The Lord be with you. From the 10th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, I'm reading it from the Common English Bible. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus replied, What is written in the law? How do you interpret it? He responded, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. 
So he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves who stripped him and beat him up and left him near death. Now it just so happened that a priest was also going down that same road. And when he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came by that spot, saw the injured man, and he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. A Samaritan, who was on a journey, came to where the man was. But when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine. And then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took two full days worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper he said, take care of him, and when I return, I will pay you back for any additional costs. What do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered the thieves? And then the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy toward him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. I've been thinking about this passage for several weeks now, thinking ahead to this sermon, and the phrase, loving your neighbor, is an important one in our time, it's an important one in any time, but it seems to me it brings peculiarly maybe peculiarly stressful feelings in our time for one reason or another. And during the time I've been pondering all of this, images have come to my mind of three individuals, and I want to tell you about them this morning. The first is a guy named Ed. Ed goes to a monthly luncheon that I attend. It's a bunch of old guys. Well, I guess if I were honest, I'd say, all of them, with one exception, are younger than me. But anyway, that's beside the point. And Ed leaned over to me at our last luncheon and said, Hey, Don, uh, after lunch, if you have a minute, could you stick around? I want to talk to you about something. I know you're a retired pastor, and I've got something about my church that I'm really concerned about. You get that every once in a while if you're a retired pastor. And so I hung around and we chatted for a bit and so I said, yeah, Ed, what, what's on your mind? And he said, well, I'm afraid that DEI is coming into our church. DEI, huh? Well, that's a word, that's, that's a thing. In my understanding, I'm a little puzzled here, Ed, because DEI, as I understand it, stands for, stands for diversity, equality, or equity, and inclusion. And, you know, those three things are pretty consistent with the things Jesus taught. So if DEI is coming into your church, I'm not quite sure I see the problem. Well, it's just all these people. It's just a whole lot of different people. You know, we get ready to hire somebody. We've got to take all this stuff into account we never used to have to think about. I don't know. He said, I just, our country just isn't the same as it used to be. Well, yeah, I agree with that. So we chatted for a while, and I returned again to the fact that, hey, you know, Ed, you've told me that you've been in church all your life, and I know that you're familiar with the teachings of Jesus, so I'm still a little puzzled why this is a problem. Well, it's just all these other people. And so I began to realize that what Ed is struggling with here is what it means to love our neighbor, because the neighborhood is so much bigger than it used to be, it includes so many different types of folks than it ever used to include. So Ed, I think, is gonna think about that for a while. Whether our conversation did him any good, the jury's still out on that, I'm afraid. But in fairness, I believe that Ed's concerns probably align with the concerns of many others in 
today's culture. The lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? And sometimes we ponder that question as well. And then the second person whose image came to my mind as I was thinking about all this love of neighbor stuff was Fred. Fred's been dead for a number of years, but I had a really great respect for Fred. Fred was a Presbyterian minister, as a matter of fact. Fred, I never met him personally, but I, in a strange way, kind of feel like I knew him. My kids felt like they really knew him. Fred had an interesting childhood. He was abused as a child, I mean bullied at school. Fred was kind of a fat kid. So not surprisingly, the kids called him Fat Freddy and said nasty and mean things about him. I suspect several days he went home from school feeling pretty bad. But you know, Fred never let that scar him. He didn't grow up as somebody who thought he had to get even for all of the abuse he'd taken. Quite the opposite, Fred grew up just spreading so much good news and so much caring and taught so much about loving neighbor, it was just really kind of amazing. Fred was a brilliant guy, not only had his seminary degree, but he also had training in music, he had training in how to do television production and all kinds of stuff. And finally there came a time when Fred has his, had his daily TV show. No, 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 now don't get the idea he was one of those TV preachers, I don't mean that. He was a preacher and he had a TV show but he wasn't a TV preacher. But he had a TV show that taught kids a lot about how to love themselves and each other. My kids watched him every day. If you would ask my kids, did you ever watch some guy on TV named Fred? They wouldn't know who you're talking about. But if you ask them if they watched Mr. Rogers, they sure would know. Because Fred Rogers, maybe he helped you raise your kids as he helped Joy and I raise ours. He taught them so much good. And I can't think about the whole phenomenon of loving neighbor without thinking about Fred Rogers. It's been said of him that he fostered a foundation of respect and kindness and empathy. He was a person that believed that love is at the root of everything. In really convincing ways, Fred nurtured a respect for other people, not a fear or mistrust of others, but a respect. At the time of his death 21 years ago, Fred left a legacy of love of neighbor shared with tens of thousands of young folks. Someone observed recently that his gentle message of tolerance and love is more important today than ever. I couldn't agree more. He also was helpful to kids in facing some of the really difficult chapters in their lives. He helped little kids come to terms with their feelings if there had been a divorce in their household or if there had been a death in their family, even if it was a death of a pet. He had these amazing puppets that had strange names. A couple of them had names of days of the week. Sarah Saturday, King Friday the 13th. And there were real live flesh and blood people on his show as well. But I have an appreciation for Fred. And I really can't think of loving one's neighbor without thinking of the contribution that he made. Well, there are a lot of people today who are influential in church leadership who urge us to place a strong emphasis in our preaching on the teachings of Jesus. Maybe more important than ever, we need to be emphasizing again those things that Jesus said, Jesus taught. The Episcopal Bishop, Michael Curry, has an interesting way of phrasing it. He said, let Jesus do the talking. Well, there's some value in thinking of it that way, I suspect. Today's reading from Luke reminds us that the greatest commandment is not singular, but it's plural. Love God and love neighbor and properly understood, you know, they're not inseparable. They are inseparable. They're not separable. And as you may recall, Jesus also instructed his followers elsewhere to love their enemies. My goodness, maybe we don't even have time to get into that one, because that's probably a whole different topic from loving our neighbor. 
or maybe not in some cases, as really was the case in the story of the Samaritan. There was another place in the New Testament where Jesus named these two commandments, love of God and love of neighbor, and that was in the 22nd chapter of Matthew. An ideal message, love God, love your neighbor, but he also added some additional words, and those words were these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now in the context in the time in which Jesus spoke those words, the law and the prophets was all there was to Holy Scripture. So if you really missed it on loving God and loving neighbor, you really missed it all. Those are pretty sobering thoughts, actually. I think it's not a stretch to view these scriptures as the essence of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And then I think of our culture today, and I wonder if Jesus were pronouncing these two commandments, if he might not say it this way, love God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and love the other as yourself. The other. Other is a big word in our culture always seems to refer to whoever it is that's on the opposite side of the divide, whether the divide is a racial one, a political one, or a cultural one. It's even become a verb, you know. Sometimes someone is accused of othering a whole group of people. The other. Who is the other for you? And I have to ponder seriously sometimes, who is the other for me? So what is a way forward for us if we're going to be really true, loyal followers of our Lord Jesus Christ? Seems like we ought to try to do something toward fostering love of neighbor. I think one of the ways that provides a clue for us is something that was taught years ago by Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa. He used to teach about a kind of a sequence for social change. First, he said, you got to have faith. And then the faith inspires hope, which creates the action, and the action leads to change. It all begins with faith. I think it's not a stretch to say that maybe the first act of loving our neighbor is an act of faith. I do have some hope, though. I have a lot of hope as I look at some of our young folks. I think the hope for our country now, as it has been for a long time, is with our young. And speaking of that, I want to tell you about the third person this morning, and that is Izzy. Izzy is a 21-year-old college junior. She goes to Kansas State University. Last year, when Izzy was a sophomore, she was walking across campus after one of her classes adjourned. And to get back to her dorm, she had to walk through another building on the campus. And as she walked through that building, there was a kind of a health fair or something going on. And there was a sign there that said something about stem cell transplants. And she thought, that's an interesting term. I wonder what that's all about. So she stopped by and she asked questions and then more questions. Conversation became a little bit lengthy, and the result was Izzy signed up to be a stem cell donor. She didn't hear anything for a while, and then one day, several months later, she received a kind of an urgent contact, wondering if you're still willing to be a donor. There's a young woman about your age, and she's very seriously ill with what is definitely a life-threatening illness. Are you still willing to donate? Yes, yes, of course she was. And it got to be a bit of a process. She ended up having to be flown to Houston, Texas, where they're in a large hospital. Her stem cells were harvested. It took a few hours to do all that. But there were two things that the nurse who was attending her said to her. First of all, she said, now, Izzy, tomorrow these stem cells we've taken from you will be transfused into the recipient. And then she said something else that just really was stunning to Izzy. She said, and tomorrow will be her new birthday. What? Whoa! And that really kind of hit Izzy like a ton of bricks. New birthday. Wow. 
And I think perhaps it was at that moment that Izzy realized the importance of all this at a deeper level, level than she had before. I've thought about this a lot. It uh, began when she stopped by and asked a simple question. And then as a result, here came what may indeed prove to have been a life-saving act. It was like that with the Samaritan, you know. It all began when he stopped by. The Samaritan stopped by instead of doing what the priest and the Levite did because they passed by. They didn't stop by. But the Samaritan, like Izzy, took some time to stop by. I've thought about this several times. And uh, I think for that Samaritan, you know, we don't know a lot of details, but I'm guessing he was on some kind of a business trip. He, he was probably on some important mission. And I don't think in his travel plans he really had allowed ahead of time time to take an extra day to take out and take some guy to a hospital and then stay with him for a while and then pay the bill out of his own pocket. Man, that is inconvenient. That's inconvenient. And I think about Izzy, you know, it didn't cost her anything. They paid all her expenses to be flown to Texas and all of that. But it cost her a day. It wasn't a day she had planned to make a trip to Texas. There was all kinds of other things that made it inconvenient. And all of that got me to thinking about some words I heard a few years ago from a guy that I always considered to be a really outstanding pastor. He served in Oklahoma City. He was a United Church of Christ pastor. His name was Robin Myers. And Robin Myers used to say to other ministers, you know, when you receive somebody into the membership of your congregation, if you want to be honest with them, this is what you need to say. Today, you're being welcomed into a covenant of blessed inconvenience. <laughs> what an interesting thing to tell a new member of the church, but what an honest thing to tell them too. And so, the Samaritan and Izzy and hundreds and hundreds of other people have been willing to be inconvenienced. The truth is, it's inconvenient to love our neighbor. Sometimes not so much, but sometimes it really is. And man, it's really inconvenient to love our enemies. But we need to remember as we think of these great commandments, we are called to a blessed covenant of inconvenience. May it be so for us. Amen. Let us continue our worship now as we return to God with our gratitude, some of that with which we have been blessed.
Gracious God, it is with sincere and profound gratitude that we give you thanks for all of those things by which we have been blessed, the material blessings that we enjoy and the blessings spiritually by which we are sustained. So accept these gifts we offer with our thankfulness, we pray in Christ's name. transition from a time of worship to a time of prayer. This is the opportunity to pray for people, places, and things that are important to us. After each one, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you can respond by saying, hear our prayers. What do we have to offer God this morning? Anything? friend of the, um, the family, but a special friend of my daughter and son-in-law was in a very serious car accident, and he's in uh, critical condition at, in the hospital, and prayers for Peter. For Peter. For Peter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Other prayers. Yes, Jim. I'm praying for the Haitian community in Springfield, Ohio and also for the people who are persecuting them, for safety and understanding for all. For the Haitian community in Springfield, Ohio, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Other prayers. Are there others? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Any others? They were gathered in a certain place, and they asked Jesus, they said, Rabbi, can you teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray? And he said to them, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us not, not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Let us prepare now to receive the gift of our Lord's Supper as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion after we sing this next song.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. O God of mercy and grace, it is truly right that we give glory and thanks to you, the source of life and goodness. As our ancestors in the faith have praised you, so we praise you this day. You have entrusted the care of the world to your human family and embraced us in a covenant relationship. When your people wandered and strayed, you inspired prophets to call them back. And your people again have wandered and strayed. And still, unwilling to give up on us, you have sent your Son into this world to live as one of us, teaching compassion, servanthood, and love of neighbor, bearing witness against the abuse of power. He proclaimed good news, offering a pathway forward when we come obsessed with our own self-centeredness. He made accessible to us a depth of grace that has accepted us when we are unable and unwilling to accept ourselves. He brings forgiveness to us even in those moments when we are at our worst. He offers grace sufficient to enable us to forgive those who have wronged us. His presence is with us in our moments of celebration and in those moments when our own agony or distress is such that our prayers are without words because we cannot find words. Jesus was crucified by the forces of arrogance and power. His very life blood was poured out, but he was resurrected, teaching us that neither evil, regardless how strong nor death, is finally victorious. We remember his life, his example, his teachings, and his suffering as we prepare to receive this bread and this cup. As they are for us his body and blood, may we be his body for our community and for our world as we seek to live in faithfulness to our calling. In his name we pray. Amen. We remember that on the night of our Lord's arrest as he sat at table with his disciples, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying to them, take, eat of this, for this is my body broken for you. And in a similar way, he took the cup and he passed it among them and said to them, drink all of you from this, for this is my blood of the new covenant that's poured out for you and for many. As often as you eat of this bread or drink of this cup, do so, he told them, remembering me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us partake with thanksgiving.
you join me in prayer, please? We give you thanks, Lord Jesus Christ, for the gifts of grace we have received from your hand. Now send us forth to reflect your light, proclaiming your death and resurrection until you come again in glory. Amen. As we go out from this, our place of worship, and return to the sights and the scenes and the sounds of our day-to-day -day lives, we don't really know who all we'll encounter in terms of our neighbors, or for that matter, our enemies. But as we do so, let us remember this great commandment and the love by which we are all embraced. And let us remember that indeed we are upheld by this covenant of blessed inconvenience. And may we find the grace to live in faith to that covenant. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Creator, God the risen and living Lord, and God the empowering and sustaining Holy Spirit be in our lives and abide with us in the remaining hours of this day and all the tomorrows yet to be. Amen. Amen. <laughs>